Indeed, watching Breakthrough News, and this is the Freedom Side Live. I am one of your co-hosts, Eugene Perrier, here as always alongside my intrepid co-host, Rania Kalik. Rania, good to be back with you. It's great to be back with you, Eugene. No, well, I deeply, deeply appreciate that, and I think both of us feel it's great to be back with all of you there in viewer land. Appreciate everyone who is... <laughs> Watching us, following us, following everything we do on Breakthrough News. This is the time I can remind you if perhaps this is your first time or you just are delinquent, you can go ahead and hit the subscribe button there on YouTube. You can also hit the bell so you can get the alerts. That way you can get all of the fantastic things that we are putting out here on Breakthrough News coming to you directly. You won't have to go looking for it. It'll make your life a thousand times easier. Just hit subscribe, hit the bell. You won't regret it. You will thank us, I bet. Because it will indeed improve your ability to engage with all the fantastic content, including dispatches with Rania Kalik. A lot of good stuff coming out there on a regular basis. So just wanted to note that as well. And one relatively new feature of the show that I want to mention is that we do have a donut, don't donut, Jesus Christ, <laughs> donate button. Uh, a donut button still. would be so cool. Um, a donut button would be would so be cool. Nice. Um, and I could just get a donut sent to me. You could just donate. get a donut. Donate. Yeah. It's donate. right there on the screen. You can see it right there below you. <laughs> you don't have to go anywhere. You can hit that. You can make a one-time donation. Anything that you could give us would be greatly, greatly appreciated in how we push our work forward. So donate, not donut. If you want a donut, <laughs> do that. Go out. I know Dunkin' Donuts in the news this week due to Ben Affleck and uh, Jennifer Lopez. So maybe we're all craving a donut. But donate. <laughs> donate. And subscribe. And while you're at it, make sure you let people know that you're watching the stream right now so whoever's following you can follow us. We've got a great show for you here today. Obviously, we're going to be talking about the uh, just ongoing tragic situation happening in Cuba in the wake of the fire in Matanzas at the refinery. Very happy to be joined by the Cuban Deputy Foreign Minister for that conversation. We'll have Ali Abu Nima with us discussing all of the ongoing issues involving Israeli apartheid and ethnic cleansing. Ben Norton is going to join us to talk about a story that you may have seen, may not have seen, because CBS stripped the thing off of their website pretty quickly, but regarding the war in Ukraine and what that really says about the media. We're also going to be talking to our good friend Kamvale Musavuli about the ongoing crisis happening in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo. So around the world and back again, we're going to have a fantastic show for you here. So any th anyone you know, I think, will be greatly gratified by everything we have, as will you. So however you may do that, online, via text, smoke signal, let them know that the Freedom Side is back. We are here. We've got a lot for them, and including a donate button, but not donuts. <laughs> now I just want a donut. Yeah, <laughs> who doesn't, really? <laughs> um, well, you know, Rania, <laughs> the... The, I guess the big story of the week here in the United States is this Mar-a-Lago Trump situation, the raid by the FBI on Mar-a-Lago, which is also, it's interesting, it's unclear exactly what's happening here, but it seems to be getting interesting to me. Scott Perry, head of the House Freedom Caucus, close ally of Trump, had his phone seized by the FBI. There were two state representatives in Pennsylvania who were involved in this this fake elector scheme to try to steal the election. They've also been served with some sort of subpoena. So not 100% clear what's happening exactly here, but it does seem that the Department of Justice is moving towards something in relationship to January 6th. We're going to have to see, um, but it just feels, people say there's no coincidences. It feels like this is not that coincidental that all these things are dropping all in one week. But, I mean, it's caused all sorts of you know, unbelievable commentary here. I mean, you've got like the most pro-police subset of America, the MAGA movement out here selling T-shirts saying defund the FBI. And I don't know, the sad part to me, Rania, is that some people somehow believe that this is actually like founded in good faith or that they actually 
you know, believe it. I'll believe that Marjorie Taylor Greene really believes what she says about the FBI when she starts tweeting out free Leonard Peltier. Then, then maybe I'll entertain it. But I mean, it's obviously just partisan. They don't like the FBI because it's going after their boy right now. But in 2020, in the, the heated uprisings, they wanted the FBI, the cops, the military, the National Guard to murder vigilantes, to just be yep. murdering people in the street for protesting for racial justice. So, you know, forgive me if I'm a little, you know, nonplussed by their so-called anti-FBI sentiment. No, I agree 100%. I mean, uh, it's purely partisan. This is, this, this is what always happens. I mean, whenever Democrats are in charge, especially uh, like recently, Republicans, the MAGA Republicans get all wild about the deep state and suddenly any war that, you know, a Democrat is in charge of, they're like, they'll pretend to be anti-war. And it, it does sound appealing, right? It sounds appealing, even when it's somebody as disgusting as like Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, it does sound appealing when someone like that is like free Assange or voting against the war in Ukraine. But the second a Republican is in charge, all of that is going to change like overnight. Um, we saw it during the Trump administration. Anything that Trump did, Trump murdered a, an Iranian general, yeah. um, the, the Iranian general, uh, which, by the way, everybody's all upset this week because, you know, apparently, according to American sources, I don't even know how accurate this is, but apparently some Iranian was like trying to pay for the assassination of, jo of John Bolton. And I'm like, how are you acting surprised when you you murdered one of their officials? And then you're right. going to act surprised when, like, maybe someone is planning to murder one of yours. I mean, you really opened the door to that one. But either way, the point is Trump was a very pro-war president, practically started a war with Iran, um, literally tried to, like, drone assassinate the president of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro. Uh, none of these people were saying a word. But now because it's Biden doing it, they are pretending to care about things that literally they will stop caring about tomorrow. Uh, yeah. And I think it's really important for people to recognize that. I mean, it's vice versa, too. I mean, when Trump was president, you know, there were certain policies he enacted that liberals suddenly cared about. I think immigration was probably the biggest one, yeah. right? Babies in cages. We, you know, like we accept refugees. We want to hug all of them. And then now Biden is doing the same exact things yeah. and no one's saying anything. So it just shows you all around what a clown show our politics are and how so many of our politicians are total partisan hacks and you really can't buy anything they're saying because it's not really based in any sort of ideological coherence. It's just about their team. Yeah, you know, I, I was told, I didn't see it, that MSNBC that they were like refusing to call it a raid. And I just thought, like, okay, obviously it was an FBI raid on the guy's, you know, property I mean. to, to get his stuff. And it just, just the partisanship element of it is so ridiculous. Uh, and, and you know, the fact it, – it's sort of like getting caught up in that partisanship in and of itself is part of the game. Uh, but it really is, like, completely absurd. I mean, you've got Candace Owens who's like, you know, let's totally get rid of the FBI and everyone unite left and right against the FBI while her next movie is about to be, like, a smear job on George Floyd and, and a whole thing about how the uprisings are not justified or whatever. So, you know, these are people who are willing to use the most tyrannical authoritarian power of all time mm -hmm. against their opponents, but when it's used against them, it's like, you know, whatever. And listen, obviously there's elements of double standards that are important to probe on different things. You know, a lot of people have been pointing to Hillary Clinton and, and uh, the issue. She did, in fact, obviously violate the Federal Records Act. I mean, it's very clear what took place there, the deletion of the various emails, the wiping of the hard drives. It seems pretty obvious that her and Cheryl Mills got off uh, without any real investigation. But I mean, you know, it's worth pointing out but it's not necessary. It's like, you know, it's like the way that it's like, oh, well, they're they're going after Trump, but they didn't go after Hillary as if, you know, somehow, the, I don't know what it's supposed to prove that somehow the FBI is mainly aimed towards the right wing in America. I mean, that's just obviously false, um, you know, but either way, it just shows, I think, so much of how our politics, I think, as you said, is it's a clown show. It's a vortex. And it's almost like it is like reality TV or like daytime soaps in that sense that to some degree, I feel the, the spectacle of of politics is drawing people away from the realities of what's really happening. And by trivializing it to a degree, by making it this huge spectacle, I think it makes it a lot easier for people to ignore the real issues that are at stake and that are at play. And the media, I think, is 100% complicit in that, both sides of it. Fox News, MSNBC, they're both just staking, stoking opposite sides uh, of the same 
controversy uh, in their own way to gain their own version of clicks, I guess you could say, views on TV or whatever. But it's really just a shame. But I do have to say, and also all the spectacle is overshadowing that, this could end up being a major moment. I mean, I would argue if they indict Trump prior to the election, or honestly after the election, if they indict Trump over January 6th, that's going to be hugely politically explosive in the country. I mean, obviously, you know, 40 some odd percent of people who are diehard Republicans in America, the vast majority of them will not accept that whatsoever. No, and I yeah. think that that, you know, you just look at the sort of the nature of what's happening, like, you know, we're moving to a space where the Supreme Court is hearing a case, you know, the Harper v. Moore that could, you know, basically make it so that what they tried to do in, in 2020, the Trump people, they could do. So, you know, that there would be basically no one person, one vote elections. You've got the possibility of Trump being indicted, driving a whole subset of America to totally, you know, believe all institutions are totally rigged and no longer represent any form of democracy. I mean, as much as we're all taught growing up, Rania, that we're living in this shiny city on a hill, this American democracy, totally unassailable, the best in the world. I mean, it really does feel like the whole thing and a lot of these underlying elements are, are sort of being pulled apart right in front of us here. It's it's notable. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there is that definitely that element to it. But I do just want to point out, like, I've seen more than one person of, like, no... Uh, tweet this uh, or, or or make a statement along the lines of like, this is the most fascist thing America's ever done. <laughs> like, I'm just like, where have you people been living? I'd like, love you to know, see, did they pass any history classes or what did, or did they just not teach them anything? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the educational records of these people. <laughs> They're just that upset about Donald Trump, like being raided by the FBI. Moreover, I mean, none of these people said anything. Uh, was it like two weeks ago that there was like a, a like a black organization in yeah. Florida? Yes. Am I right? Florida African People's Socialist like, Party in Florida and yes. St. Louis. Yeah, that that were raided by the by the FBI for supposed ties to Russia, and I didn't see anybody really say anything. I saw a couple of news headlines. Crickets. So I mean, actually. crickets, crickets. But also, I mean, I do think it's a big deal, though. You're talking about a very pro-Trump institution, the FBI, right. uh, raiding the former president. That is pretty unprecedented and a pretty big deal. So it will be interesting to see, like, what's actually behind that and what comes of that but it does definitely speak to i think a level of extreme like illness in america's politics that like this is where we're at this is the conversation that's being had it's like again you called it the vortex <laughs> this kind of clown show where there is like very little faith in any institutions in america and i think that's kind of across the board um and yeah, it does speak to like a sort of failing system. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that that we are not going to have time to get into in the next couple of minutes. But I mean, I also think you made a really good point about whether this might galvanize people. Um, if Trump is indicted, what does that mean for upcoming elections in yeah. terms of the ability to galvanize his base and to galvanize the Republican base? Because they do come out in force. I mean, Democrats do need to tread very lightly in terms of the sort of horse race nature of all of this. Because... It's kind of like the abortion issue being used to galvanize Democrats. This could be used to galvanize Republicans. Um, but also, we're not a horse race show, so I don't want to spend too much time, no. you know. We'll do it closer <laughs> to the election, for sure. Right, yeah, uh, totally. Although, yeah, the other big losers of this, I would say for sure, are all these people who think they're going to run against Donald Trump in 2024, potentially, who are kind of hiding. This really solidifies his position at the head of the Republican pack. But they're probably all secretly hoping the Ron DeSantis of the world. They're probably secretly sitting around with their fingers crossed, hoping Trump hoping is indicted, indicted so he can't yeah. run. Of course. Of course. <laughs> well, uh, so that's where we are there. But of course, we'll continue to cover that story. And certainly if anything big, ha big happens, you know, you can expect us to be on top of it. But we want to turn to another huge story in the world, certainly for our hemisphere. And that is the massive blaze that took place in Cuba. It has taken place in Matanzas after a lightning strike hit a large oil refinery there on the island. It's been a, obviously a huge blaze. I'm sure many people have seen the, the photos of just unbelievable size of this fire, which has had a huge impact on the country writ large. And we are very happy to be joined as we continue the show by Carlos Fernandez de Cosio, who is the deputy foreign minister of the country of Cuba. Minister, thank you so much for being with us. Pleasure being here. 
Well, the first thing I wanted to, to ask you, and really the pleasure is all ours, is I think, you know, many people in the U.S. have probably seen a lot of the, the photos and they get a sense that this is a big deal. But what role does this refinery play in the broader sort of Cuban fuel and power system? And, and what's the impact that this fire is really, really having on the island? Well, first of all, actually, it's not a refinery. It is a deposit and a fuel terminal in the Bay of Matanzas. The Bay of Matanza is perhaps the deepest bay of all the bays in Cuba. And 30, 40 years ago, we decided to establish there our main facility for the import of fuel. You must know that Cuba uh, is not capable of producing all the fuel, fuel that we need. We can produce some, which is used mainly by electricity, around 30% of our electricity, but the rest is uh, we need to import it. And that is the main terminal and the main storage place for the fuel that we import. That's the importance that it has. Maybe like a, uh, a break down how this has impacted Cuba. Uh, before we get to the issue of sanctions uh, and things like this, how has this particular incident impacted the uh, power sector in Cuba? It has a huge impact in general because of the cost of the, the amount of resources that are lost. But first of all, we have, we've had loss of life. It is not close to where people live. It's an industrial sector, but it's quite close to the city of, of Matanzas. And therefore, the fumes and the smoke does affect the population. But also, we've had loss of life of some of the firefighters there that went uh, initially to fight the, the blaze. The blaze is currently under control. Uh, we still have, it's not over yet. There are still specific areas with flames that would take a few days to put them out, but it's already under control. And the firefighters are capable of working in the area. It's not anymore an area of a, an ongoing crisis. But the loss of, 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 of property, the loss of technology there is huge. We've lost four of the main of the eight main tankers there there are many more but there are eight huge tankers we've lost them uh, and the tankers themselves is an important infrastructure loss but also the amount of fuel that, is, that, that has been lost as you know the u.s has in policy a, a a practice of trying to deprive cuba from importing fuel and therefore it has become very difficult and very costly for us to import fuel the loss the amount of of gallons of fuel that we lost, which we have not estimated yet, is huge and that has a huge financial cost for our country. And it comes in a moment in which we have problems with the availability, availability specifically of diesel that is used in some of, of our, what we call our distributed power plants. But we also have a huge problem of electricity, not because of the lack of fuel, but because of lack of maintenance of outdated technology and the capacity to generate in many of the plants that we have as a result of the many difficulties that Cuba has to obtain credit, to engage economically with other countries and with other companies around the world. Well, I really appreciate you laying that out for us so systematically. And I, and I, you know, this is to some degree implied, but I was hoping you could talk about, you know, what is the impact of this U.S. blockade on Cuba of the ability to, you know, both, I think, address the fire, recover from it, but also some of the other problems that you've laid out in terms of, of, of economic transactions? Well, the, the economic blockade, or the U.S., they call it the economic embargo, but it's beyond that. It's not only that the U.S. prohibited selling to Cuba any product, to export anything to Cuba, with the exception of foods under very restricted and limited conditions. And, and to, it also prohibits the export to Cuba from any country around the world of any product produced anywhere if it has 10% or more of U.S. origin, implying spare parts, software, technology, raw materials, whatever. It also prohibits the import into the United States of any product produced in Cuba or produced in any country around the world if it has 10% or more of Cuba, uh, Cuban components. Now, in a globalized world, that has a huge impact on your economy. To give you an idea, Cuba cannot buy planes, airplanes, civilian aircraft anywhere 
because it is impossible to find any aircraft produced in this world that does not have at least 10% of US technology. But even goes beyond that. The US by law, the State Department has by law the obligation to go around and look for Cuban financial and commercial transactions any country with any country in the world, anywhere, to try to put obstacles to it. So it, may, it becomes very difficult for Cuba to obtain financing for its exports or for its imports or to obtain credit. But in addition to that, the US, because it has included Cuba illegitimately in a list of the De Department of State of countries that allegedly uh, uh, practice or promote terrorism, it implies that an important amount of financial institutions around the world would deny Cuba any cooperation, any contact, or, or, or deny any transaction with Cuba because of fear of being punished by the US, even though they know that Cuba is not a country that sponsors terrorism and that the list of the State Department is unilateral, it's illegitimate, it has no international recognition, but yet they fear that they could be punished by the United States. All of that has a tremendous impact on the, our efforts to develop our economy and it poses huge limitations to obtain technology, to, to purchase, to buy, to obtain credit, to find companies ready to participate, for example, in the building or the repairing or infrastructure. This was shown under, uh, under COVID and is shown now when we're having this huge problem with our power grid. You know... After this uh, latest uh, horrible disaster took place, so many countries reached out uh, to try to send help. Um, I think America, the Americans made a statement. I'm curious if the United States has done anything to try to assist Cuba. I won't be surprised if you say no to that. But furthermore, has there been, from the Biden administration specifically, any sort of move or even suggestion that they would be willing to loosen the noose, if you will, on Cuba? Or has this just been sort of a repeat of the Trump administration? Or has it been worse? Uh, first, I have to say that the response of many countries and, and people in general around the world has been immense. The amount of solidarity that we have felt. I have to point out the cases of Mexico and Venezuela, which immediately send help. Mexico alone sent, I think it was 16 planes with personnel, technology, resources, equipment, and Venezuela did something very similar. Their help, both Venezuela and, and Mexico, has been crucial in our ability to, to control the, the blaze as it is now and to put it out and to avoid a major disaster that could have occurred. We have also received a message of solidarity from other countries, condolences, and some level of help in medical supplies and so on. With the U.S. government, we had communication from the beginning. They, they reached out, expressed uh, their condolences, and they, appraised, they, 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 they spoke of the readiness to assist Cuba with technical advice. And since then, we've had several communications. That's more or less what there has been in place, and we have continued to have communication because because still we need to recover from the impact and the consequences of, of what happened. And hopefully there would be cooperation coming from the U.S. I cannot discard it. And I can say that from the U.S., many people and many organizations both sent help, uh, expressed their solidarity, uh, which we appreciate greatly. You know, it just seems to me that really, the, I mean, obviously, I think we could say this any day, but certainly after, you know, such a major disaster like this, that the only real way, the or maybe not the only real way, but that if the U.S. really wants to help, that the best way would be to lift the blockade and to lift these, these measures. I just wonder what you think about that. That would be the most meaningful, the most coherent, and the moral thing to do, I would say, in this juncture. If you cannot lift it as a whole, the president of the United States has a lot of leverage in his hand, and there's a lot, a lot that he can do to alleviate the current conditions. There are many, that, many actions that he could take that would at least alleviate the current condition and with it to make a difference. 
You know, one other thing that it just strikes me about this is I, I can remember like it was yesterday. I don't know if that says how old I am, but you know, when Hurricane Katrina happened in the United States, which was such a horrible disaster, I mean, Cuba was right there almost right away. It, I think it was like 1,500 doctors, a huge number of people they were offering to the United States, ready to go, fly to New Orleans. Obviously, the country needed it. The U.S. rejected it. And it just seems to me in, in these sorts of tragic circumstances, when, when you look at the impact of, of what the blockade has done in, in separating the two countries, that it's just a very anti-human, very anti-people policy. And that really, even beyond the, the tragic times and the disaster times, that, that both countries and both peoples are really being hurt by these policies day in and day out. Well, uh, it, it wouldn't be the first time in history that countries put politics aside, that put political differences aside to try to help in a, in a severe, in a grave moment of, of need. We did that, as you say, uh, during Hurricane Katrina. We offered the same on, on, nine, on September 2001 after the attacks on the, uh, in, in New York and, and Washington. And we offered blood, we offered our airports, we offered our, our airspace if it, if it was needed. It, it wasn't used at the time, but we offered it immediately. And we did so in Katrina. Uh, as you mentioned, and other okay, another occasion it has happened. In the case of Cuba, it has been very and extremely rare for there to have been a gesture from the United States for something like that to happen. In 2001, after two hurricanes, there was an offer of support by the then George W. Bush administration when we had a very difficult moment, and we were able to find a way of, of cooperation and, uh, and exceptions to be made in the in the in the very severe policy of of, of blockade uh, against Cuba, so it's not rare around the world, but it is rare in the case of U.S. and Cuba. You know, it seems as though in at least the last maybe 10, 15 years, maybe a little bit longer than that, the sort of Cuba model, uh, the blockade model, has been imposed increasingly on countries around the world that the U.S. views as adversaries. And so I'm just curious if, and this maybe this is a little bit of a pivot here, but I'm curious if on, on an international level, you see a kind of growing solidarity, maybe growing group of countries that are coming together more and more as a result of this maybe overzealous use of of sanctions. And again, like I called it the Cuba model, you know, and of course here I'm talking about Syria, Venezuela, uh, Iran. Um, and I mean, the list goes on now. Russia is like a huge, you know, <laughs> a huge portion of, of the sanctions are being targeted on Russia. China is increasingly being sanctioned. Um, and it just seems to me, I mean, you see a, a sort of a, a bit of this in the uh, group of uh, friends of the UN charter. But do you feel as though maybe we're entering an era where the U.S.'s use of this policy, of this tool, this weapon of economic warfare, uh, is actually perhaps backfiring in a way. Well, it is true that the U.S. has become addicted to the use of economic coercive measures or sanctions, as uh, as you call them, and they're increasingly doing so. It has become a a describing a, a definitive. Uh, characteristic of U.S. foreign policy for the past 20 to 30 years. It's not new. The U.S. has been applying this type of measure perhaps since the 19th century, but it, it never at the level and never with the frequency and the repetition that it does it today. And it, it, would, it would lead and it increasingly leads to countries to uh, mistrust uh, trade, commercial activity with the U.S., and to protect themselves. Any government around the world would see that sooner or later, they can be the subject of US coercive measures. They will, of course, try to, to take measures with their banking operations or commercial operations so that they can be protected eventually from the impact of US sanctions of US coercive measures. And it would lead, and it can lead, to a, to a separation of two worlds. One in which people, in which countries can deal and would deal with the United States, but they will increasingly find alternative avenues in the case they would eventually come under the 
the punishment of U.S. economic sanctions. You know, one thing I, I want to ask as well is, you know, in terms of moving forward, what are some of the biggest challenges Cuba is going to be facing? I mean, I know we've talked about power outages and other things like that, but, you know, moving forward now as the blaze is contained and, and looking to the process of recovery, what are some of the biggest challenges you all will be facing and trying to overcome in the, the coming weeks? Huge challenges. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you more or less how, how we see it. We have a, an ongoing U.S. system of sanctions, the most comprehensive that has ever existed against any country ever, and it's been there for the past 62 years. Greater than any other that exists today, the greatest it comes is the one against Cuba. There's no indication in the horizon that that is going to change anytime soon. At least it, that is not going to change significantly. So we are convinced that we need to try to sustain our economy, to develop it, and to fight and to find prosperity in spite of the existence of this U.S. economic course of measures or, or of the economic blockade. And we have to do it with, with the capacity of Cubans to resist and to do it with creativity, with the talent that we have developed in our country, the education and the capacity that Cubans have proven, for example, to put out and to control this place in spite of the fact that we lacked the technology that exists in some other places, that some experts that uh, saw what was happening and gave opinion, said that it would be impossible for Cuba with the resources that we had, the material resources to put that out, and yet we have been able to control it. It is a demonstration of what we can do, as we did with COVID when we put our human resources uh, together. Now, that is easily said, easier said than done. It's a big challenge for us. We need to find the investments in by the end of the year, at least, to be able to recover our capacity in terms of electrical generation. We need to improve our, uh, our capacity to produce foodstuffs so we can reduce the dependence on food imports. We need to increase investment, and that is very difficult, in alternative sources of energy so that we don't have to depend on hydrocarbons as uh, we do today. And we have to, 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 take, to make sure that all these challenges do not stop and do not prevent us from putting in place the types of economic and social transformations that we have committed to since the past five to six years in, in terms of the constitution, legislation, economic transformations, and so that we can put our country in the path to the future that we are seeking, ensuring that we can continue to have social justice as we have known and even to improve that social justice, knowing that our adversary, the United States, does not want to change that condition. And also looking at the immense political challenges and threats that are occurring within the United States, the huge problems within that society, that many of the friends are, that with which we, we, we relate and that come to us and tell us, you, you see what's happening to you, just feel what's happening to us in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our jobs, in our, in our families, in many parts of the United States. Mm -hmm. Well, Minister, I know you must be very busy, but before we let you go here, any final words you would like to leave our audience with? That we will continue to try to extend as many links and as many bonds as possible with people in the United States. We know that the U.S. government and, uh, and their policy, it's in the way. We'll try to go around it, but we'll find ways. We know that we need to create greater, greater contact, cultural, religious, economic, just friendliness, whichever way possible to engage with people in the United States. Well, so Deputy Foreign Minister Carlos Fernandez de Cosio, thank you so much for giving us some of your time here on the Freedom Side. Thank you. Wow. Well, America, yeah. America. Typical, <laughs> just destroying the world in the most ridiculous ways. I uh, just want to shout out Martin Hernandez for your donation. Also had a couple anonymous donations. Shout out to all of you. Martin Hernandez, strong with us since the very beginning here in the Freedom Sides. Definitely mm -hmm. appreciate you and all of you anonymously donating. Appreciate you as well, wherever you may be. Big shout out to everybody who's watching as well. But yeah, Rania, unbelievable. I want to just say quickly... Um, there is, I've been told, 
a website, letcubalive.info. That's letcubalive.info, which uh, I believe has a mechanism by which people can send letters to President Biden to say that they want him to, you know, change these policies in order to, you know, make it easier for Cuba to overcome these challenges. I mean, it's just amazing. You just think like, I, I don't know. I mean, if there is ever, I mean, and I think the, the deputy minister, foreign minister put it well, you know, put aside politics in these moments of crises and Cuba has consistently done it for the United States, but let for less for the U S it's like, ah, eh, who cares? You know, I mean, whatever. Yeah. And it's almost like they, they like these crises to happen because oh. they want to, to weaken the country. No, I mean, this cri a crisis like this, a disaster like this is actually very beneficial for the U.S. because this is what that lightning strike did yeah. is literally what American policy is intended to do to countries like Cuba, which is to make it impossible for them to function, to make it impossible for them to have regular electricity, regular regular services, functioning infrastructure to make people miserable. On per That is their purported policy. That is like their stated policy goal in Cuba is to make people miserable yeah. so that they'll rise up and overthrow the government um, for America. So when there's a natural disaster that does it for you, you got to bet the U U.S. officials aren't sitting there. Maybe a couple of them on an individual level feel sad for Cubans um, and have convinced themselves that they're doing this to help Cubans. But as far as policy is concerned, this is just in line with American policy. As far as America is concerned, that lightning strike was a pro-U.S. lightning strike. Yeah. Well, you know, before I turn to our next story, I do just want to ask you this, Rania, because you were just in Cuba not that long ago, a few months ago, uh, and seeing the impact of this blockade, I mean, you know, what 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 was your reaction when you saw this happening? I mean, you've already seen how in non sort of crisis times, what the impact of this has been on the Cuban people. Uh, I mean, I'm just curious some of your reflections on 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 what what it could be like there now with this being exacerbated by the the, the fuel crisis. Well, yeah, no, I mean, the first thing that came to mind is, oh, my gosh, Cuba's going to have less electricity. And, you know, that's what you need for, like, a modern society to function. You need electricity. You need to be able to turn on the lights. You need to be able to use the Internet. You need to be able to put fuel in your car so you can go places. You need to be able to transport food in trucks from one place to another so people can eat um, and transport products in general. So my first thought was, like, this is catastrophic because people – it's just going to make people's lives more miserable. They're already dealing in Cuba. Obviously, people in Cuba are living to the best of their ability. There's still a, you know, a revolution in progress there that people are very proud of and still participate in. But that doesn't mean it's not easy. Life is unnecessarily difficult because of this blockade. It's not just the electricity cuts. It's the shortages that people have to deal with. And the government's trying to deal with it as best they can. But people still have to wait in long lines for basic products because of an intentional policy of deprivation. And so this is just adding on top of that. It's so unfair. It's so, you know, in, in normal circumstances, if that were to happen in America, that would cause big problems on top of the death and destruction, right? And so imagine in a country like Cuba where things are already, you know, very on the edge because of this blockade. And it really just made me angry. That's how I felt. It made me angry. Mm -hmm. Um, in a way that like, it's like the Cuba should be like any other country in the world, be able to respond to natural disasters like this. And, 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 and they are responding, but of course they're lacking, um, because of this blockade. And it just, it makes me mad. Yeah, no, I hear you for sure. Also want to shout out Salome and Eric for your recent donations. And now we want to turn to another story, a very important story, and that's the ongoing issues with apartheid and ethnic cleansing in Palestine. And we are very happy to be joined as we continue the show by Ali Abu Nima, who's the director of electronicintifada.net. Ali, thank you so much for being back with us. Thank you, Eugene, and thank you, Rania. Well, obviously, we saw over the weekend, yet again, another round uh, of attacks on, on Gaza and also, of course, in the wake of that, you know, further targeted assassinations in the West Bank. I mean, you know, in some ways, I'm always a little hesitant to ask this question, but I know it's one that's always in the media is sort of why these attacks and, and why now by the Israeli authorities? Well, that is the question, and the, the question of why now is uh, depressingly easy to answer, and that is uh, Israel always has to kill Palestinians because it is 
um, an, illegit- an illegitimate settler colonial regime that faces uh, constant resistance from the people whose land it is uh, occupying, colonizing, and stealing. And that resistance is very active. It's uh, very deep and wide in terms of the resistance of the Palestinian people. And therefore, uh, as a colonial entity, Israel has to keep killing Palestinians in the hope that, uh, you know, as Israeli leaders call it, uh, mowing the lawn is the term they use, that, you know, just as uh, an an American uh, homeowner might have to go and mow their lawn uh, every week or two to keep it down, the Israeli generals and leaders think that, you know, you have to mow the lawn of Palestinian resistance. But you're not cutting grass there. You're, You're actually murdering men, women, and children. Uh, but that is the kind of terminology they use, which just shows really the, the psycho- psych- psychopathy of uh, a settler colonial regime. And that's what we saw in Gaza starting last Friday. Israel um, carried out an extrajudicial execution of a Palestinian resistance leader, uh, one of the senior commanders of the Islamic Jihad resistance group, a very cowardly attack, but very typical of Israel, where they fired multiple missiles at his home in a, uh, a residential apartment building, killing uh, him along with a number of civilians. And then they proceeded to bombard Gaza for three days, killing uh, by today because people uh, horribly keep dying of their injuries. At last count, it was uh, up to 48 Palestinians including um, 17 children at, uh, at last count. So this sadly is a repeated pattern, and it's, it, it's, um, this is the price of Israel's continued existence as an apartheid and colonial regime. The regular shedding of Palestinian blood is a necessary component of maintaining Israel. Now, that's an excellent point to, to raise, but, you know, uh, the, these sort of regular massacres, you and I talked about this a few months back when we were, uh, when it seemed as though Israel was laying the groundwork for some sort of escalation in Gaza. So an escalation with Gaza because of this mowing the lawn um, strategy that they openly talk about is to be expected quite regularly. Uh, That said, I think something interesting about this time around, of course, was that it was targeted specifically at Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Um, And whereas previous uh, escalations with Gaza have been between the Israelis and Hamas, of course, Palestinian Islamic Jihad has participated. But what do you what do you think that's about? What is what is it this time around that has Israel really like pointing its guns at Islamic Jihad? Is it because of what's taking place in the West Bank? There seem to be, you know, regular um, ongoing fights between the Israelis and resistance fighters who are Palestinian Islamic Jihad fighters, specifically in Jenin. Um, And if that is the case, it does, I think, show some sort of new situation here where there's this kind of uh, cooperation in a way between what's happening in the West Bank, between Palestinian resistance in the West Bank, and Gaza as well. I don't know if I'm reading too much into that, but what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I I wouldn't read too much into the fact that Israel specifically targeted Islamic Jihad because they they target all groups in turn. Uh, Remember, um, almost no sooner than a ceasefire had been reached in Gaza, Israel, uh, you know, that happened, I think, on Sunday or Monday. On Tuesday, Israel launched... Uh, a, a, you know, an assault in the West Bank uh, against, um, uh, it was really an extrajudicial execution, again, in a very populated, densely populated residential area. This was in the old city of Nablus in the West Bank. Uh, They uh, surrounded a house where two Palestinian resistance fighters were from the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, which is actually a group that is at least on paper linked with uh, Fatah. And they uh, fired um, anti-tank missiles into the house to execute uh, these these two fighters, including um, Ibrahim and Nabilsi and Islam Sabur. And so th- they will attack, you know, different groups in turn. Um, Israel is going on a big campaign now. Uh, the Israeli Defense Minister Benny Gantz uh, saying, you know. 
uh, Islamic Jihad as an Iranian proxy in order to justify uh, the uh, massacre which Israel committed. And he claimed that Islamic Jihad, uh, that Islamic Jihad receives tens of millions of dollars a year from Iran. And I only hope that that is true because um, Islamic Jihad is a legitimate resistance group uh, engaged in resistance against a brutal and illegitimate occupation. And Palestinian resistance groups have an absolute right to receive uh, aid and assistance from anyone who'll give it to them. And uh, as far as we know, Iran is the only country that provides military assistance to the Palestinian resistance. And I think the answer to those who object to uh, Palestinians receiving resistance to Iran is to advocate for more countries to provide um, assistance to the uh, armed resistance against uh, Israel's uh, occupation and apartheid regime. But, you know, what they always do is, uh, you know, uh, they try to claim that, uh, to use the fashionable term, that Palestinians have no agency, that they're just puppets of Iran, when the reality is Palestinians are fighting and dying and resisting on their own account uh, to liberate their country, and they will take, as they have the right to, assistance from those who will give it. I'm sure if other countries were to uh, to provide uh, 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 assistance to the Palestinian military uh, resistance, they would take it. So um, th that's the situation. That's why Israel, you know, for decades and decades, they... That it's the same uh, story that uh, we kill, you know, we've just struck a major blow to uh, the Palestinian uh, uh, terrorists, as Israel calls them, uh, by killing this or that personality. And of course, it never does, because uh, there's another generation of people uh, being brought up in the resistance to fight Israel. And the issue is not that there are Palestinians who are willing to resist. The problem is that there is an occupation and a colonization which uh, necessitates resistance. What's the alternative for Palestinians? They've tried surrender. The PLO signed uh, basically a surrender deal with Israel and the Oslo Accords in 1993. It didn't stop Israel from accelerating its theft of Palestinian land uh, for colonial settlements. In the West Bank, the Palestinian Authority openly collaborates with the Israeli occupation. That doesn't protect Palestinians. In fact, even with the latest massacre in Gaza, Israel has killed more Palestinians in the West Bank this year than in the Gaza Strip. So, you know, Palestinians are in a situation where uh, the, the, uh, the surrender doesn't appease the Israelis and fighting back doesn't uh, appease them. So what are they supposed to do? Clearly, of course, resistance is the way that uh, Palestinians on the ground ha have decided they have to, uh, 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 to fight back against the existential threat that Israel presents to the Palestinian people. Well, you know, picking and up on a couple of those points sorry. too, and, and yeah. you know, thinking about the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade and the leaders they lost and... and, and <clears throat> you know, Mr. Nabulsi's final statement where he said, don't give up the gun. I, I mean, where does this leave the Palestinian Authority leaders? I mean, it was interesting to see, like, I don't know, the deputy head or whoever say about that, oh, you know, we're honoring our martyrs. But it really does feel, and I know this was an issue about, many people were saying why the elections were delayed, that there is a, a, a real distance between the leadership in, in Fatah and the Palestinian Authority and, and really even their own, you know, quote-unquote base and their organization. I mean, where do you think this this leaves them in this current moment after having, you know, such a prominent leader uh, assassinated and, and celebrated in the West Bank? I mean, they're, they're puppet rulers, and everybody knows it. All Palestinians know it. The so-called international community knows it. The Palestinian Authority doesn't represent anyone. It openly collaborates with the Israelis. The attack in uh, Nablus was in an area that is ostensibly under Palestinian Authority control. How can Israeli troops just enter into the middle of, uh, you know, downtown Nablus uh, without the Palestinian Authority knowing? I don't know what happened in this particular case, but typically when the Israelis are about to attack Palestinians in a Palestinian Authority area, 
they uh, inform the Palestinian Authority to withdraw its men so the Israelis have free reign. And we know that there are, uh, you know, there's document, well, a well-documented pattern of the Palestinian Authority actively collaborating with Israel to arrest, torture, and even kill Palestinian uh, resistance fighters because the Palestinian Authority is, is the U.S.-backed proxy in Palestine. Um, and it's, so it's part of the, uh, the, the apparatus of oppression and occupation and colonization of, of the Palestinians. So, uh, and then, of course, what we saw in terms of the reaction uh, to the Israeli attack was, of course, absolute full support from the Biden administration, from the European Union, from Britain, from Canada, from all the usual suspects. Uh, the condemnation of Israel's attack came from, um, you know, the the majority world. Let's call it from Malaysia, from South Africa, from, uh, you know, from various other countries that that strongly condemned this. Interestingly, Russia, which you know is is has is has historically been close to Israel and supportive of Israel, and we know that there is, you know. It, Russia, despite its intervention in Syria, has allowed Israel to continue to keep bombing Syria. And that has to be mentioned. But uh, it was interesting to see that the Russian uh, embassy in Egypt uh, issued a statement attacking uh, Israel for its criticism of, um, you know, alleged uh, Russian atrocities in Ukraine, in Bucha, uh, saying, you know, how dare Israel... Uh, uh, attack Russia and claim Russia did this when Israel is, you know, attacking, uh, showing utter disregard for uh, Palestinian lives in in Gaza. Uh, so, the the minority world, the the you know the the the, the NATO Euro Atlantic countries, uh, full square behind Israel. The rest of the world, to a much greater extent, uh, sees the reality. But unfortunately. Uh, wh whereas Israel is getting huge supplies of uh, weapons and support from the so-called West, uh, it's only Iran that is supporting the militarily supporting the legitimate Palestinian resistance, and that needs to change. We need to see much more support for the. Uh, you know, either there's only two ways to do this: either the so-called international community has to stop Israel, rein it in. Uh, isolate it so that it can no longer harm and kill Palestinians, or they have to help Palestinians fight back. Th those are the only two ways to go. You know, speaking of uh, resistance supported by Iran, I mean, Hezbollah, the Lebanese resistance group Hezbollah was, of course, watching this very closely. They're allied with the Palestinian resistance. And of course, there's this sort of like looming threat of a war with Israel over the um, over the maritime negotiations uh, with the offshore gas fields in Lebanon. Uh, and their, their um, sort of interpretation of this latest uh, escalation was that it showed Israeli weakness. Um, and I'm curious if you agree with that, uh, with that view in the sense that, you know, Israel is constantly, quote unquote, mowing the lawn, right, to reestablish its deterrence. Um, but I, it doesn't seem to me that this has reestablished or established any deterrence in the sense that the Palestinian resistance still has the capacity to strike at Israel. Islamic Jihad, which is a small faction, right, There's, Islamic Jihad isn't the biggest uh, military group that Palestinians have, and they were able to launch hundreds and hundreds of rockets at the Israelis. So I'm just curious uh, what you think about that viewpoint that this showed a kind of Israeli weakness. No, I think that's absolutely right. But that's been true every time. And, and remember, Israel, uh, and you're right, Islamic Jihad, the, the, the Palestinian resistance deliberately kept this as, as limited a confrontation as they were able to. Their strategy was to force Israel into a ceasefire without too much escalation, and they did that. And despite that, you know, there were no serious injuries and no deaths reported in Israel. But nonetheless, Islamic Jihad was able to disrupt Israel's air traffic, uh, to shut down parts of Israel. You know, there were reports from, major, from Israeli cities like Ashkelon that the streets were empty, everything was closed, people were in their houses. Uh, and Ben Gurion Airport, you know, they had to to, to stop um, 
movements, landing and take takeoffs and so on for periods of time. Uh, so major disruptions of, of uh, you know, quote unquote, normal life in Israel. But the, the, there is no military solution to, the, to Israel's illegitimacy. This is a settler colony, a minority population, the Israeli Jewish population, squatting on top of an indigenous majority, the Palestinian people, and squatting on top of them with brute force. That people, any people, who, no matter who they are, will resist that. And a, a settler colony like that cannot, I've said this before, it cannot bomb its way to legitimacy. It cannot assassinate and murder its way to legitimacy. And uh, eventually it will fail. You know, Israel is not a permanent fact of our region. Perhaps the people are because, you know, uh, the Palestinians are extremely generous uh, just as the South African uh, people were extremely generous with their oppressors and said, you can live here among us under conditions of equality, but you can't live here as our rulers, as our oppressors. And Palestinians have said time and again, we will live with Israeli Jews as equals, as, as uh, people living you know, in the same country, but we will not accept to be subjugated by you. But uh, Israel's insistence, like all colonizers, is we have to be the masters. We have to be in charge. You have to do what we say. And if you don't, we have the right to kill you. And that is just not a proposition that Palestinians will ever accept. And so uh, either it is permanent and escalating bloodshed or the Israeli apartheid regime has to be brought to an end. And it will be brought to an end. And it's and I think that these settler colonial regimes, like in Algeria, like in South Africa, tend to become more vicious as they approach their mm -hmm. end because the settler psychosis and settler fear of giving up power really becomes the dominating uh, uh, emotion and dominating response. We have to kill or be killed. But the reality is that the, the colonized peoples tend to be uh, very generous, some would say much too generous to their oppressors in making the proposition that we will live with you on conditions of equality. Historically, the colonizers refuse equality and leave. So, you know, a million whites left South Africa because they weren't willing to tolerate equality with black people. All the whites left Algeria because they could not tolerate the idea of equality with uh, with uh, Arabs in Algeria, and this is this is uh, really the pattern. It's a settler colonialism. Uh, that we're on the path of settler colonialism that other countries have trod, and it must end in liberation or in uh, or in genocide. And genocide is not an op. You know, the Palestinians will not allow themselves to be genocided by this brutal regime. Well, Ali, as always, it's an honor to have you on the show with us here. Of course, director of electronicintifada.net, author of The Battle for Justice in Palestine. Once again, thank you so much for giving us some of your time here on the Freedom Side. Thank you so much. Ali, always gets me fired up. I don't know about you. Yeah, but. no, absolutely. I mean, it really is. I mean, the sort of, you know, moral realities of this are, are so clear. But yet and still, you know, there's so much of a, a of a this this bizarro world through the looking glass reality where somehow, you know, Israel is treated Both as if sides. Yeah, you know, there's some sort of equivalence between what's being done on on either side. It's I, I don't even know what to say. It's outrageous. It's amazing. You can't even believe it. But yeah, I mean, the level of resistance, it's you know, it's funny to me. I was reading the Times of Israel uh, a couple of days ago, and they were saying how the Israeli government had admitted that they had not actually done anything at all to affect the operational capabilities of Palestinian people yeah. in the jihad. And I was like, well, right. would you do it for them? Why? I, I mean, you know, yeah. it's all, it's just the sort of cosmetic reality of murdering Palestinians to continue, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this, this constant pressure against them. But it's obviously working less and less. Uh, also, it looks like we had two more donations of $5. Shout out to everybody who donated those five dollars. Can we just from now on say thank you for the donuts? Can that be like our thing? Is that too no. corny? 
No, it cannot. It can't be. You're no. putting your foot down. It's like, I, nah, I like how that was like an immediate veto. Yeah. I don't, I'm going to say it. Thank you for the donuts. Yeah. yeah. Well, no one who was watching at the beginning, who wasn't watching at the beginning will know what you're talking well, about. Well, now Thank they, God. now they have to go back uh, and watch at the beginning. They do. Yeah. So they can know what I'm talking about. Which is a good point to, to say again, that we do have the donate button live <laughs> here. Uh, I think it's just under our screen. So you can click that and make a donation through there. Anything you can do be great. All donuts appreciated. appreciated. All donuts, all donations, all clicks, views, shares. Don't forget to hit subscribe, hit the bell so you get the alerts. But we want to shift gears here now to maybe the best way to frame this is the the role of war propaganda in shaping our views of things. And, you know, this CBS story with Ukraine is what we want to get into. But we are very, very honored to be joined for this segment by the journalist and editor of the new outlet and podcast, Multipolarista, Ben Norton. Ben, thank you so much for being with us. It's always a pleasure being here. It's one of my favorite shows, so thanks for having me. Oh, thank you so much, man. I appreciate that. We love all the work you do as well. And, you know, I think some people may have seen something about CBS having a story, having it involve Ukraine, something happening with the story, but they may not know all the details. So before we maybe get into what it means, if you could, Ben, what was this CBS story about Ukraine and, and what happened once the story came out? Well, thanks for asking about this, Eugene, because this is getting very little coverage in the media, but it should be a big scandal. In, in short, what happened is CBS News produced a documentary that was very anti-Russian. It was not in any way pro-Russian, but it acknowledged the fact that among the tens of billions of dollars of weapons that the U.S. and its Western allies are sending to Ukraine, around only 30% of those weapons end up actually on the front lines. The documentary acknowledges that there's massive corruption going on in Ukraine. There's a big black market for weapons. The, the journalist from CBS who uh, was there on the ground embedded with the Ukrainian military. Again, this is a very pro-Ukraine documentary. It's very biased, but he himself had to acknowledge the fact that he spoke to people who said that there are lots of oligarchs and warlords who are profiting off of this war, and the majority of the weapons are not actually going to the Ukrainian soldiers. And he interviewed someone from Amnesty International, which is now under attack for acknowledging the fact that Ukraine has committed war crimes. But Amnesty International has a long history of being very biased in the interest of Western governments, having a revolving door with the US government. And this Amnesty International researcher acknowledged that in Ukraine, there is massive corruption going on. Many of these weapons are not going to the fighters. And she drew the parallel to ISIS, pointing out that ISIS got its hands on many of the US weapons that were sent to Syria and that were left behind in Iraq. So what happened? CBS actually censored this documentary and the foreign minister of Ukraine attacked CBS and called for an investigation into CBS for reporting these facts. And again, I need to stress this fact, this 24 minute documentary, I watched it all. You can find a copy of it online and it is extremely pro-Ukrainian, very biased, very anti-Russian, but even for Ukraine, even for Western governments, this pro-Ukrainian propaganda is not pr propagandistic enough because it acknowledges some inconvenient facts about corruption. It really is striking. It does seem like, um the for the the tweet by the foreign minister that you just mentioned the ukrainian foreign minister it was after cbs had literally retracted the documentary they took it down they censored the documentary and so he was responding to that saying this is not enough you need an inter so there needs to be an investigation into why this was ever even allowed to air but i guess the question becomes like what is this about? Is this about, is there some sort of like pro-Ukraine lobby that is behaving in a way that's, because you mentioned Amnesty. I mean, Amnesty International came out with a report and you're welcome to talk about that a bit as well. Amnesty International last week came out with a report essentially saying that the Ukrainian side of this conflict is committing uh, violations of international law, potentially war crimes by basing themselves inside schools and hospitals and shooting from schools and hospitals and other things as well. It was pretty damning. And they too have been under an intense pressure campaign. It seems to be this kind of like mix of think tank people and 
um, you know, foreign officials from the Ukrainian side, as well as maybe some, you know, some former U.S. officials. But like, what is this? Is this a pro-war lobby? Is it the pro-Ukraine lobby? Like, where is this pressure coming from? Well, from all air, all sectors, what this really shows, Rania, is how the corporate media is always the handmaiden for war propaganda. It's always, you know, obediently following the line of Western governments, specifically the U.S. government, when it comes to these wars. And this is a clear example of a media outlet censoring its own documentary, its own journalism, in order to advance the foreign policy interests of Ukraine. What this reminds me of is just a few days ago, Australia's new foreign minister, Anthony Albanese, gave a speech at the headquarters of ABC, which is an Australian broadcaster. It's their version of NPR. It's a state-funded media outlet. And at this, this anniversary gala, the new Australian prime minister called for expanding funding for ABC in order to spread propaganda against China. He said very clearly that we're in an information war with China. And he said that the point of ABC is to advance Australia's foreign policy interests and national security interests. He didn't say to educate the public. He didn't say to inform people about what's going on. He said, this is a tool of soft power. And that's exactly what CBS and all these other media outlets are. They claim to be independent. They claim to care so much about you know, freedom of speech. But at the end of the day, they're tools of soft power. And in this instance, this documentary, which despite the fact that it was extremely anti-Russian, it did a little damage to the to Ukraine's reputation and the Ukrainian government got angry so that the foreign the media outlet censored itself on behalf of the foreign policy interests of Ukraine and by extension the west I, I mean it really is is unbelievable on so many different levels i mean it would be one thing if it was like a third hand report but as you said they're embedded on the ground they're there they have all these other people and i know amnesty hasn't taken their report down but i believe they apologized for like the pain that was caused by the report that they put out which just seemed stunning to me in many different ways because obviously you know the real pain are the civilians who were been murdered because of what Amnesty was reporting on. But, uh, and, and, and of course, if you want to explain that a little bit more, but it, it, it does feel that any negative news about Ukraine or the Ukrainian government, it like it, it can barely slip through a crack. And if you catch it the first day or so it comes out, maybe you hear it, and then the information space is closed down immediately. Well, uh, Eugene, another important fact about this Amnesty scandal is that the, the head of Amnesty International was forced to resign. And this is similar to another scandal that happened recently where Michelle Bachelet, who was the head of the UN Human Rights Office, was also forced to resign because she went to Xinjiang, China, the Western province in China, and did a report in which she was like, yeah, there's no genocide happening. And now she's being forced to resign by all these Western governments because they continue to show that when they say human rights, it's not about human rights. It's a tool used against their geopolitical adversaries. And they don't care about Uyghurs in China. They don't care about Ukrainians. They certainly don't care about Russians. I mean, this is all about advancing the geopolitical interests of the US, NATO, and the European Union. And it's very cynical. It's very disgusting to see human rights instrumentalized in this way. And as you pointed out, the people at the end of the day who are suffering the most are the civilians on the ground, especially in Ukraine. How many thousands of Ukrainians, including young men who are conscripted to fight in this war, have lost their lives? And then you see these Western governments so nonchalantly saying the only way to end this is winning on the battlefield. So Joseph Burrell, the head, the foreign policy chief of the European Union, he has repeatedly said that in his public statements. This war will be won on the battlefield. Well, his sons aren't fighting in Ukraine. He's saying that young Ukrainian men have to sacrifice their lives in this war they can't win in order to try to weaken Russia. Anyone who's serious about wanting peace, it should be calling for peace talks and saying, yes, obviously Russia bears responsibility as well, but it's the US that started this war in 2014, sponsoring a coup, overthrowing Ukraine's government. Billions of dollars of weapons were sent into Ukraine since 2014, before Russia invaded in February, fueling this war. 14,000 Ukrainians died between 2014 and the end of 2021. All of that is erased. It's all about the big evil boogeyman, Russia. And if you say that you want peace talks, if you say that the Ukrainian government and the Russian government should sit down in a third country 
Turkey has offered to sponsor peace talks. Belarus, if you say that that's the solution, then they say that you're you know, a pro-Russian propagandist, you don't care about Ukrainians. Well, those of us calling for peace aren't the ones sending Ukrainians to go die in, a, in, a, you know, uh, in this pointless war like cannon fodder for empire. We're not the ones who want Ukrainians to die. We want peace. It's the West that doesn't want peace, unfortunately. You know, it's a, a, a few of the things that you just mentioned make, remind me of how much of the pro-Ukrainian side uh, has basically labeled anything that is inconvenient towards uh towards keeping this war going forever, basically. Anything that is inconvenient to, to that end has been labeled as disinformation. And you even have the BBC appointing its first um, disinformation correspondent. And it, you know, something that struck me that I heard a, a friend of ours say recently is equating disinformation with, like, basically disinformation is the new terrorism. Right. Back at, you know, back during the war on terror, every, when that was like the, the dominant form of warfare the U.S. was committing around the world, anybody who opposed that war or who spoke of an inconvenient fact uh, against that war was called uh, like a terrorist sympathizer or accused of uh, harboring terrorist sympathies or being like a, aiding and abetting terrorism. And now that's the way that the term disinformation is being thrown around. It's like you're a disinformation agent, you're aiding and abetting disinformation, you're, you're participating in disinformation. And what's wild is that, you know, terrorism is at least something tangible, right? It's like, well, sort of, I mean, it's kind of a meaningless term, but you know what I mean? Like there's a terrorist attack is something scary. A, a bomb goes off and people die, right? It's something where you can actually make people feel emotional about it by, by, by pointing to, you know, violence in the past that makes them feel sad and scared. But with the term disinformation, it's having the same impact in terms of the way it's making people feel and I don't quite understand why, because you can't really point to something that like, how do you make people fear that? It's so, it's so imaginary. You know what I mean? But I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. I'm curious what your thoughts are on the way that this term disinformation is being thrown around and how this really is like, like the, the warfare we're dealing with now where we're all accused of being disinformation apologists. Well, Rania, the way that you make people afraid of disinformation is you try to say it in Russian, like disinformacia <laughs> or whatever they do. And they always say, they never just say disinformation, they say Russian disinformation, Chinese disinformation. Right. It's always about associating it with this foreign boogeyman. But I think this is a really important point because we have to understand that what we're seeing really are desperate attempts by these Western governments that have become so unpopular because of their neoliberal policies, their undemocratic systems, they're desperate attempts to control media narratives and censor information that is inconvenient to, for their foreign policy interests. We saw recently Gallup published a poll that found that 11% of people in the United States, they believe uh, TV media and 16% of people in the US believe newspapers. We know 7% of people in the US believe Congress, have faith in Congress. Uh, we know that just around 20% have confidence in the justice system. We know that Joe Biden's approval rating is around 31, 32%. So we see across the US and Europe, massive distrust of political institutions in the media. We see a complete failure of political systems to provide any meaning form of democratic representation. We see living standards dropping, life expectancy dropping for the first time among a new generation. We see that people are trapped in horrible jobs, driving Uber and delivering food. And, you know, people just don't feel like they have any hope. They don't have any future. Poverty is getting worse. Homelessness is getting worse. Meanwhile, the rich keep getting richer. You know, inequality is getting worse and worse. Racism is getting worse. So what we see is an attempt by these neoliberal governments that refuse to in any way create social programs to support their people. Instead, they say the problem is China and Russia. We have to wage a new Cold War. And then they say that if you say something that is convenient to China and Russia, you are engaging in disinformation, you are committing a crime, and we have to censor you in order to control those narratives because they want to convince us that the real problem is not the capitalist class, you know, eating up all the wealth and destroying society and destroying social programs and making us poor and, and exploiting us. 
No, they want us to believe that the real problem are these foreign boogeymen, these foreign adversaries. This is what you know elites always do. They try to scapegoat their foreign adversaries or they try to scapegoat immigrants or whatever. And that's why they're so desperate to try to censor any information that they see as inconvenient. And they have you know, two big boogeymen that are rising powers that is very convenient to them. And they happen to be, ad- they happen to be allies now, China and Russia. You know, I think that's a very good point. And I, I would certainly be remiss if I didn't note that you yourself were attacked in the New York Times over this exact issue uh, and the issue of being, you know, so-called Chinese disinformation and, and even being more insidious because you don't have any ties to any like foreign government. It's almost like there are these people out here who have these beliefs that aren't actually even being paid by the countries, but they can be used by them. I mean, it almost made it even <laughs> more like Manchurian candidate style sinister on so many different levels. But I think that's such a good point because the other aspect to this that seems crucial and why I think maybe they don't want you to know what's going on is, you know, you look at Russia. I mean, obviously Russia was trying to work with the West for many years. And this eastward march of NATO, they were like, listen, we don't want this, but can we collaborate? Obviously China, I mean, I I forget the exact phrase, you might remember it, Ben, but it's like, you know, we wanna have a moderately prosperous society by 2030, which definitely does not sound scary to anybody. And so, you know, when you look at this, it's like they have to really front load everything so that when you hear, oh yeah, Russia was trying to work with the United States since 19, 90 on collective security and really before that if you include the soviet union or like yeah china really just wants people to you know basically have a decent standard of 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 living by 2030 that you'll think oh well they're just lying because it must be some other sinister plot so it does feel that the truth about what's really happening which is is not scary and maybe good that the united states could have broader collaboration with countries around the world around global challenges is exactly what gets lost yeah, I mean, uh, the the Chinese, uh, I guess they, they, they thought that if they, they put moderate before it, it would have made the, the West, you know, sympathetic to it. All you have to say is, you know, moderate rebels, moderately prosperous, and <laughs> they would have hoped that the West would support them. But no, uh, in this case, no, they don't want any prosperity because, look, the reality is that the system is coming apart at the seams. We have to understand that the era of neoliberal capitalism that we talk about, this phase of the capitalist world system, is the phase of capitalism of US unipolar hegemony, when there were no other systemic challenges to the US-led global capitalist system. The Soviet Union was overthrown in 1991. Other countries in the socialist bloc were overthrown. There was massive counter-revolution across the planet. And the US was the only game in town, and it could impose these neoliberal policies through financial institutions like the IMF, like the World Bank. And we saw that even national liberation struggles that succeeded, like the glorious important liberation struggle against apartheid in South Africa. Even when they were able to defeat the apartheid regime, Nelson Mandela was forced to impose neoliberal policies because the U.S. was the hegemon. That system has collapsed. There are now alternative poles, and China is a socialist power. Now, you can, we can talk about the differences between the Chinese model and the Soviet model. They're certainly not the same, but it's still a socialist state-led economic model. And for the U.S., that is intolerable. The whole point of this wave in the 1990s of this idea of, you know, um, the great middle class boom and this idea of comfort in the West, that was predicated on the ex- super exploitation of labor in the global South. And we've seen, especially in Asia, living standards rising among those workers, which means that goods from those areas have, have become more expensive, which means that it's harder for elites in the West to try to sell to their working class who's paychecks are getting smaller and smaller by the year to sell them on this idea that they can have cheap consumer goods. Another key part of that neoliberal boom was debt. It was a bunch of households just having, uh, you know, home debt through mortgages, um, student loan debt. So a lot of this idea of middle-class prosperity was based on debt. And then the other huge part of it, in addition to the cheap consumer goods from Asia was the cheap energy from Russia. Russia was basically destroyed in the 1990s. It turned into a kind of semi-colony of the West and was just used to extract resources, as Obama called it, and, and, and McCain called it a, a gas station. Well, that situation has changed. The neoliberal economy can no longer rely on cheap energy, as we see now in Europe, and it can no longer rely on cheap consumer goods from Asia and super exploitation of those workers in Asia. So now they have to have some kind of redistributive measures so their working class can in the West can actually have a living, 
you know, an actual, you know, standard of living that provides a house for them with, you know, so many people homeless, provides healthcare and education. And they refuse to do that. They refuse the ruling class, the capitalists in the US and increasingly in Europe, refuse to give crumbs to their own working class. And this neoliberal system has collapsed. They no longer have the safety valves that they had in the 1990s and early 2000s with the rise of China and Russia and other parts of Asia, Indonesia, India, Bangladesh. So that's why the US is waging a new Cold War. It's to try to destroy those rising powers and drag the world back to the 1990s to reimpose neoliberalism around the world, which really is the phase of capitalism of US unipolar hegemony. And unfortunately, for them, fortunately for the world and unfortunately for them, I don't think you can put the genie back in that bottle. Certainly people in Asia are not going to tolerate being recolonized. Mm -hmm. Well, Ben, before we let you go, where can folks find your work? People can go to multipolarista.com and I have a lot of articles in English and Spanish and I have videos. So thanks for having me, Eugene and Rania. Keep up the awesome work. It's always a pleasure being here. Right on. Well, Ben, it was such an honor. Great to have you. And I hope everybody checks out Multipolarista. Thanks. Oof, another one to fire us up. We indeed, got the good guests indeed. today. We always have the good guests, actually, yes, which is why you should continue to guests. watch the Freedom Side. Make sure you subscribe. I see we've got more people uh, donating. Thank you to Robin Bennett and also those anonymous donors. Keep hitting that donate button, you guys. Donate for a donut. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, I couldn't help myself. Uh, I know. Sorry. I know. This is, and, and for the people watching, this is just like during the show for you, but I'm going to have to live with this for months uh, outside <laughs> of this framework. It's constant. Chats. You guys, I, I am like a factory of dad jokes. Yeah, that's that's actually true. Uh, that is 100% true. Um, <laughs> we'll leave that there for now. So we want to turn our attention here to another very important set of stories really all emanating from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And we are very happy to be joined by a good friend of the show, Kambali Musavuli, who's an activist, a writer, and analyst with the Center for Research on the Congo Kinshasa. Kambali, thank you so much for being back with us. Oh, oh, I think you might be frozen. frozen. I wasn't sure if I was frozen or he was frozen. I think Kambali is okay. Let's hopefully was, we get that yeah. fixed. You were frozen a little you bit. Were, you were thinking, I was, I was, unfortunately. Internet problems follow me around the world. That's, and power outages. <laughs> uh, and power outages. Story for another time. Anyway, we're going <laughs> to yeah, try to get yeah. Kambali back on here to talk about everything that's happening in the DRC, a few different threads of, of stories there. But yeah, you know, to pick up a little bit too on what Ben was saying, I mean, it really is amazing in some ways that, CBS would censor itself like this on this important story. And it does speak to me to the mentality of, you know, these these corporate politicians. I mean, you know, obviously this is one of the things that Noam Chomsky points out about manufacturing consent. Uh, or it looks like we might have Kimbale back uh, just to finish that point really quickly, which is that, you know, people it's not just like people being paid to lie or whatever, but that people sort of self-select to put these biases in play because they know what's acceptable and what's not. But let's see if we if we do have Kimbale back here. Hey, Kimbale. Yeah. Hmm. Mm. No audio, like, though. Even. Lagging a little bit. Yeah. I see him moving now. Kambale, do you hear us? I hear you well. I hear you. Okay. Great. Well, Kambale, let me just start here because I think a lot of people in the U.S. have probably seen multiple things, you know, in terms of the Congo. I mean, both the uptick in violence that's happening vis-a-vis -vis the M23 movement. I think people have probably seen a little something about the United Nations. And of course, Anthony Blinken was there sort of addressing some of these points uh, in his recent trip. So, you know, maybe just help folks understand sort of the state of play, especially as it concerns the, the eastern part of the country. What's being missed in this discussion is that the trip of Secretary Blinken is directly connected uh, with the war uh, in Iraq. Uh, and also, the oh, Taiwan I might be question, losing you here. Uh, is being presented. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you able to yeah. hear me now? Oh, now we can hear you. Yeah, so what I was saying is that uh, this conflict is directly connected to what's happening at the border of Russia and Ukraine, right? The Ukraine Russia war, but also with Taiwan. 
it's being presented as him coming for the crisis in the DRC. It's not just the crisis in the DRC. It has to be looked at the geopolitical level. Why am I saying that? Uh, before his trip to the DRC, uh, we have had visits of uh, diplomats uh, from uh, Russia into the DRC. Some people know that Congo was one of the countries uh, that supported the first resolution uh, condemning uh, Russia around the crisis. Um, but subsequently, the Congo, the Congolese government has changed its position because there's so much On one hand, uh, the U.S. Uh, condemning Russia due to the invasions, uh, what they call the invasions of Ukraine. But then at the same time, there was a rebel uprising in the DRC of the M23 rebels, supported by Rwanda, a staunch U.S. ally, and the U.S. has not taken any action against that. Uh, against Rwanda uh, and around uh, the situation. So that shifted uh, the Congolese government policy where they've sent delegation to uh, Russia. We've had Russian diplomats to the DRC and the Russian government offers support uh, to the DRC to bring an end to the conflict. And right after the announcement of Russia supporting the DRC to the conflict, we see the visit of Secretary Blinken. But he's not the only one in Africa at the moment, even though we're talking about DRC. We know also in Ghana, uh, we have uh, uh, U.S. Ambassador uh, Thomas, uh, Linda Thomas Greenfield, who arrived mm -hmm. in, in Ghana about a week ago, telling Ghanaians that they should only buy fertilizers and grains uh, from Russia and not buy anything else, pretty much dictating to Africans uh, what they should do. So wh why is this trip um, interesting to even discuss, right? Because about speaking about who is M23? So M23 is a militia group supported by an arm equipped by Rwanda. Uh, they have destabilized the Congo. Today we call them M23. In 2012 to now, they've been called the M23. Before that, they were called CP. Before that, they were called the RCD. Before that, they were called ADL. Ramble in saying that we have a rebel that keeps changing names. So for anyone who come into the situation in the Congo now, they will be confused. Who is the M23? We hear all these militia. It's the same group, just as Blackwater changed its name to Xi for the world to not know who they are. This is what reporters, articles on the DRC, they don't give you the background to know that they are literally speaking about the same rebel group, just rebranding itself with a new name. What does Rwanda want in DRC? They want access to land. They want access to mineral resources. Uh, probably mineral resources that fall this way uh, into our modern day technology. Your cell phone, your laptop, your DVD player, uh, VCR, and modern day technology uses Congo's minerals. The destabilization of DRC allows for the mineral resources to be exploited. Now, in 2022, there was a uprising of the M23 rebels right when the Congolese government was negotiating peace with some of the armed groups in the RC. They had sophisticated weapons. They had night vision goggles. They had sophisticated uh, missiles and uh, grenade launchers, which made the Congolese government notice that this is not normal. Now, they did not have this firepower before. How come they are able to fight at night and no precise location. Thanks to the UN group of experts that they publish a report documenting with drone imagery, satellite imagery, and also eyewitness testimonies, it was clearly documented with evidence that the Rwandan military is actually fighting with the rebels, also arming them and equipping them. This is a very um, what? Because Rwanda is a U.S. ally on the war on terror, which means that Rwanda's weapons has been give, given to them by the United States military. So U.S. taxpayers' money is arming the Rwandan regime. The Rwandan regime is using the support to arm rebels in the RC. These rebels are displacing population. They have taken over a town. 
they are killing people, and there is no agreement to Rwanda because they are U.S. ally on the war on terror. But in the case of the Congo, that's where I will try to bring my comment to a close. In the case of Rwanda, the Congolese people are not asking the U.S. to use its authority for U.S. say that, no, let's make sure on uh, Rwanda to stop doing uh, its uh, bidding in the DRC. That's not what we are asking. All we are asking is for the United States to stay true to its own law. What does that mean? In 2006, there was a U.S. law that was signed by George Bush. Surprisingly, it was written by then Senator uh, Barack Obama. So when he was a senator, he wrote many uh, bills, but only one of them in his record in the uh, U.S. Senate, only one bill became law. And that bill was called the Democratic Republic of Congo Relief Security Democracy Promotion Act of 2006. What does this law say? In its section 105, the law says that the Secretary of State has the power to withhold aid to any nation destabilizing the DRC. This is a US law. So now the Secretary of State Blinken shows up in Kinshasa, had an interview with local press, and he himself, in an in a interview with the press in Kinshasa, says that he has great evidence that the Rwandan regime is supporting rebels in the Congo. That's what he did after he made a sentence. Well, it looks like we might have lost you totally there. Yeah, it looks like we might have lost. That's a, sh a shame. Which is sometimes you gotta. Sometimes that happens. It's so it's so frustrating because what he was saying was so important. No, I know. Um, Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, I'm just saying what he was saying was so important. It's so frustrating. Just uh, internet woes every once in a while. Yeah. You know, no, technology sure. gets you. Hey, listen, technology, that's where we are. But no, important points, I think, that, you know, he did make at the outset. I thought the connection, I certainly did not know this, between DRC switching its position vis-a-vis -vis Russia, uh, you know, and then all of a sudden this rebel uprising happens from Rwanda, this U.S. ally who's being armed by the United States and giving these 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 uh, heavy weapons and sophisticated weapons to the, the 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 rebels there in the Eastern Congo. I mean, it's a very very notable piece, and it does show. I mean, I mean, as much as anything else, uh, Rania, you know how Central Africa really. I mean, it always has been, obviously, since the rise of of the slave trade and then colonialism to the sort of broader you know, agenda of the Western world system. But now, and, and I think Kambale laid this out correctly, I mean, you know, all the high technology, so much of the, you know, clean technology, all these different things, even now in the context of the war in Ukraine, you know, oil and gas resources, coal, other things like that. You know, I, the, the control of Africa by these Western nations being so central you know, really to the need uh, of these these Western nations to survive. I think someone told me once, like, maybe the number is not 80%, but something like that of the light bulbs in, in France powered by uranium from Niger. And it just makes you think that we're going to see Africa become more and more of a battleground, a lot of it through mm -hmm. these proxy wars. Obviously, what we're seeing in Eastern DRC, but as we've talked about quite a bit on this show, what we saw in Ethiopia uh, in the use of the TPLF. And, and, and it really does feel that you know, we're, we're seeing more and more of this on the African continent. Absolutely. And I think that this last this visit by Anthony Blinken right after uh, Lavrov was was making a tour, was doing a tour of Africa yeah. and just going around and talking about, you know, malign Chinese influence and malign Russian influence as the Americans are literally threatening and trying to bully African countries into siding with them on sanctions against Russia, literally dictating to them what they can and cannot purchase from Russia, um, commodities like what you can't you can't purchase fertilizer, you can't purchase fuel, you can purchase grain. When we say you can purchase grain, like I think that there's definitely it's definitely a turning point to some degree right now as we witness like what's taking place over the war with Ukraine and like the American 
reaction across Africa and the rest of the developing war world is seeing a little bit of pushback of saying like, who do you think you are telling us what we can and cannot purchase for our people like, to feed our people or to fuel our, our, our country? I mean, obviously it's not the case across Africa. There are many countries like anywhere else in the developing world that are still very much captured uh, by American imperialism, by Western imperialism. But it is notable to see that I think something like half of African countries abstained from or uh, actually refused or, or voted against the UN resolution to condemn Russia uh, when the war started. And so many of them have continued to refuse to get on board with uh, these UN unilateral Western sanctions on Russia. I think that's a big deal. That's why you have Anthony Blinken running around you know, making himself yeah. look like a fool in one country after another. <laughs> So-called new strategy on Africa, you know, which, and the whole thing started in South Africa with the U.S.-South Africa strategic uh, dialogue. But, you know, anyway, there's so much to be said, but I think we do maybe have Kambale back here. Let's see if we can bring him in. Kambale, can you hear us? I can hear you perfectly. Oh, perfect. You also sound very clear to us. So, I mean, maybe just pick up, where you left off, because I, I think you were explaining sort of the the role of the United States and and you know the, in the in the whole thing there in DRC. Yes, I mean the context of it, and especially the press uh, that the the uh, kind of angered uh, the Congolese people. Uh, the reason why it angered is, is because it was clear that the United States has a information we have uh, that, that is ally a so-called ally on war on terror, um, is supporting rebel groups in the Congo, cause stabilization, and you taking action. But we, we said that uh, we don't need goodwill of the United States action against right. We actually, actually want them to apply their own law. Uh, the heaven that was written in 2005 by Barack Obama, it became uh, law in 2006, signed into law by George Bush. Um, the it's called Public Law 10945. Uh, the Democratic Congo Relief Security Promotion Act of 2000. And this uh, law says in 105 that the of state the power to withhold aid to nation destabilizing the Congo. Then we have Lincoln in Kinshasa, uh, who says in front of the media, he the evidence provided by the UN group of ex experts is credible that Rwanda is supporting uh, rebel groups in DRC. And then we are going to ask ourselves, if the Secretary of State has evidence that Rwanda is supporting us, why is he using U.S. taxpayers' money to fund the Rwandan government? And that's the prediction of his trip. It's a uh, that's why we are clear that they are not come. He's not coming to the DRC. Uh, help the Congolese have peace and stability. Uh, he's not coming to the DRC to bring an end to the conflict. Uh, we know that he's coming to the DRC to put pressure the Congolese government to be at the side of the United States as it relates to the question of Russia and to the question of China and trying to use this lever of his taxpayers' money to fund. Uh, the elections, as he put it, that the U.S. is pledging twenty-three dollars for the elections in the U.S. in twenty twenty-three, and this does not address the fundamental needs of the Congolese people who want a no fair, fair election, a government, not a government that's still waiting to tell it what. what. That's uh, in in general what is unfolding. We have Blinken, uh, but I do believe that uh, when we're discussing the M23 and what the U.S. is doing around it, it's a point that the reason why it's there is not because of the M23. The reason why Blinken is traveling to Africa uh, is uh, Russia and China's influence on the African continent. Well, let me also ask you this. I mean, I think one of the other aspects of this is the United Nations and what's going on with, with the UN, um, you know, and I, I, that's, you know, in and of itself tied in with this. And I've, I've seen that. I think Congo is now thinking about removing the UN mission in Eastern Congo. I mean, what role is the UN playing there uh, in this broader conflict? 
the UN mission has been in DRC for 20 years plus. Uh, they came to the Congo to stable and bring about peace and stability in Congo. They have not achieved that. Uh, the current protest by the Congolese uh, to have the UN forces removed uh, from the DRC didn't. Uh, I mean, go back, you see almost there, Congolese have been demanding that uh, the UN forces leave. Why are the Congolese people demanding that UN forces leave? We have massacres that take place in cities uh, and uh, villages there. The UN forces are literally few meters away from that. They are able to hear the people scream. They are able to hear yelling. Yet they don't take any action. We've seen also cities uh, taken where you have UN forces there um, without any action. So that's one aspect: the inability of the UN forces to take action to protect civilians. The second aspect of it is that the UN forces have been implicated in illicit of re uh, mineral resources. Not because I'm saying it, because the UN itself has written reports on the bad deeds of its UN peacekeepers. Third, the UN forces have also engaged in violence against the Congolese. They have raped Congolese women. They have uh, also killed, I mean, lately, the past protest as the UN over 30 Congolese were killed. Uh, we did not see the UN uh, spokesperson go to the funerals uh, of the families. But we saw is that the UN reps were able to go to funerals of UN soldiers. I think there were two, and one police officer were killed uh, during the protest. They want to pay their respect to the UN forces. So all of that has angered the population. And it did not start this year. It has been going on for years that the Congolese have demanded that the forces leave. Mm -hmm. Now, the time is a question of should they leave now or not? I believe that the UN forces should leave. But as they leave, the Congolese government should get the responsibility to protect the civilian. And the, that's what the Congolese people are calling for. A billion dollar um, the budget to have these forces has not brought uh, peace and stability. So there should be a roadmap for them to leave. So the pressure that the Congolese government is exerting on the UN is not coming from them. It's actually coming from the Congolese people themselves, who for over, uh, over the years um, have called for the UN forces. That's also been the same situation in Haiti. Uh, that people also have demanded that the UN forces leave because they have been in, in, inefficient and the same uh, in the DRC. But I want to add one more point. The uh, inefficiency of the UN is not tied to the UN itself. It's actually tied to specific members of the UN Security Council, particularly the United States and the United Kingdom. Because UN peacekeeping mission, take, they take the lead from the permanent members of the Security Council. The United States and the United Kingdom do not want to see peace and stability in the DRC. And the reason we can say this forcefully is because the same evidence that I have, which was confirmed by the Secretary that their allies are the ones arming, training, and equipping rebels. So if you know that Rwanda is arming, equipping rebels in the DRC, why are the UN forces in the Congo? Shouldn't they be under? That's where the problem is, lies, right? So that's where this is coming. So because of the lack of political will at the part of uh, two members of the, the permanent member of the Security Council, we have not seen but the Congolese people left. Uh, this is why we have more and more protests against the United Nations at the moment in the DRC. Mm -hmm. Well, Kambale Musavuli with the Center for Research on the Congo, Kinshasa, we really appreciate you giving us some of your time here on the Freedom Side. Thank you, S.O.L. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of wow. important points there. You know, unfortunately, the Internet's gremlin sabotaging us a little bit. We'll have to do something like get Kambale on dispatches with Rania Kalik or something like yes. that to, to lay out all of this because it really is 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 crucial and important. And 
the DRC right at the heart of so much of what's happening uh, around the world. But uh, as always, Rania, this brings us more or less to a close of our show. I'll remind people, of course, you can go to patreon.com slash breakthrough news. It's patreon.com slash breakthrough news. Become a patron. Really appreciate your ongoing support, all our existing patrons, all our potential new patrons today and moving forward. Everything you do, every donation you make really makes a huge impact on what we're able to do. Shout out to everybody who donated. Um, as well today inside of the chat. So patreon.com slash breakthrough news, become a donor. Make sure that you hit that subscribe button. Make sure you hit the alerts, all of that, so you can get everything that we're we're doing. Rania, I see you chomping at the bit there. Go ahead, go ahead. And donuts. Oh <laughs> Sorry. Is, I know, I know. And if I you want to know, if you want to know what I'm talking about, you need to go back to the beginning after this is finished live streaming. Go back to the beginning and just just the first five minutes. And make a donation when you do it. Uh, and make a donation when you do it. Thank uh, you. Nevertheless. So I can buy a donut. So I can buy a donut. Yes. Your donations go to donuts. <laughs> <laughs> Always a pleasure being alongside you here, Rania. Yeah. And shout out to the whole Breakthrough News team that makes this show possible. We'll see you next week on the Freedom Side. Thank you.